If you recall, way back in Volume 1, when we first started talking about coupled systems, we worked with spinners. And now, in Volume 3, we're going to be able to bring that story to completion and talk about the synchronization of an arbitrary number of spinners. So just to go back to that situation when we had two oscillators, two spinners, their states were given by theta 1, theta 2. These are both angles, so they're both points on the circle, and they satisfied the following. The derivative of theta 1 with respect to t is omega, a constant, plus some small coupling constant epsilon times the sine of the state difference theta 2 minus theta 1. The dynamics on theta 2 are the same. You've got d theta 2 equals the whole thing, but with a minus sign in front of that coupling term in order to compensate. Now, letting phi be the phase angle, the difference between the two states, theta 2 minus theta 1, we derived the dynamics on phi. d phi is Let's see, it's d theta 2 minus d theta 1. The omegas cancel. We get minus 2 epsilon sine phi. And because this had a stable equilibrium at phi equals 0, these two spinners synchronized. Now, what we're going to do is generalize this not to three spinners, but to n spinners, or more technically, n plus 1 spinners. We're going to set up a linear chain of n plus 1 spinners, and we're going to couple these together. So the spinners are going to have states theta 1, theta 2, all the way up through theta n plus 1. And then there's going to be phases or differences between incident spinners. And because we have coupled them together in a linear fashion, then we're going to have phi 1, which is theta 2 minus theta 1, phi 2, which is theta 3 minus theta 2, and this continues all the way down the line. Phi k is equal to theta k plus 1 minus theta k. So what are the dynamics? Well, we know d theta 1 is just like it was before, omega plus epsilon times sine of theta 2 minus theta 1. But what's different is what happens with d theta 2, because theta 2 is not only connected to theta 1, it's connected to theta 3. So what we get is d theta 2 is omega, its internal frequency, plus epsilon times sine of theta 3 minus theta 2 minus epsilon sine theta 2 minus theta 1. So the guy to the right pulls you forward, the guy to the left pulls you back. This continues in the same pattern all the way up through d theta n, which is going to be equal to omega plus epsilon times sine of theta n plus 1 minus theta n minus epsilon times sine theta n minus theta n minus 1. That last spinner, the n plus first spinner, only has two terms in it. You get omega minus epsilon sine theta n plus 1 minus theta n. It looks very similar to what happens with the first spinner that was only influenced from the right. The last spinner is only influenced from the left. Now we see all throughout the system, all of those phases. So what we want to do is to convert the system to the dynamics on the phases. To get that, we simply take the definitions of the phases, for example, phi 1 equals theta 2 minus theta 1, and then differentiate that with respect to time. Substituting in for the derivatives of theta 2 and theta 1, we get d phi 1 equals quantity omega plus epsilon sine phi 2 minus epsilon sine phi 1 minus quantity omega plus epsilon sine phi 1, giving us minus 2 epsilon sine phi 1 plus epsilon times sine phi 2. Now that's a somewhat exceptional case because it's at the end point. In the interior, where you're looking at phi k, the difference between theta k plus 1 and theta k. The derivative of phi sub k is, with a little bit of work, epsilon times quantity sine phi k minus 1 
minus 2 sine phi k plus sine phi k plus 1. And doing the requisite work to show that that continues all the way down until you get to the last one, which is a little bit different, what we get is a system of equations, most of which have these dynamics on the interior points, where you're pulled from the right and the left, but at the end points you have some particular forms. Now this is admittedly a pretty complicated set of equations, but recall we're really interested in characterizing the synchronization phenomena. The system has a lot of equilibria, but it's the origin that we care about. The origin is special. That is what is going to control synchronization. So if we take that system, linearize at the origin, using the fact that the derivative of sine at zero is just giving us that linear term, then we can see, we can pull out from this system the derivative, the n by n matrix. This is going to have a very special form. Along the diagonals, you're going to get minus 2 epsilon. On the super diagonal, and on the subdiagonal, you're going to get positive epsilon. And then everywhere else, you're going to get zeros. Now, this is a very nice matrix, a very special type of matrix that is called a tuplets matrix. In fact, a banded tuplets matrix. It's constant along these things that are parallel to the diagonal. And banded means that it's zero outside of a certain strip along the diagonal. We say that this is a banded tuplets matrix of bandwidth one. And if that sounds a little bit like signal processing to you, then maybe it's because there's an interesting connection there that we do not have time to talk about. What we are going to talk about is the eigenvalues of this matrix. Here are the facts. The eigenvalues of this matrix lambda sub j is given by negative 2 epsilon, that diagonal term, plus 2 epsilon times cosine of j pi divided by n plus 1. And this is j going from 1 up through n. Those are the eigenvalues. What are the eigenvectors corresponding to these? The jth eigenvector has as its kth component sine of j times k times pi divided by n plus 1. Hmm, this smells a lot like there's some complex analysis going on there. Maybe. But let's think. Let's think about those eigenvalues in the context of synchronization. Recall, lambda j is 2 epsilon times quantity negative 1 plus cosine j pi divided by n plus 1, j going from 1 to n. The first thing I notice is that because cosine is between negative 1 and positive 1, and you never get cosine of 0, that means that all these eigenvalues are real and negative. That means that we have a stable equilibrium at the origin. This system synchronizes. But how quickly? Well, notice because all these eigenvalues are real, there's a dominant eigenvalue. And the dominant eigenvalue is going to tell you the convergence rate. Everything is going to line up with that dominant eigenvalue and dominant eigenvector. Now, in this case, the dominant eigenvalue, the one that is largest, has j equal to 1. Convenient notation that. Lambda 1 is equal to what? Well, I've got 2 epsilon times negative 1 plus cosine of, what is it, 1 times pi divided by n plus 1. I'm going to expand that out using the Taylor expansion for cosine, since for large values of n, this is kind of close to 0. And what am I going to get? I'm going to get 1 minus 1 half times quantity pi over n plus 1 squared, plus 1 over 4 factorial times that stuff to the fourth, and then it keeps going. Let's say we're in the regime where n is kind of large, so that I'm going to get rid of all those higher order terms. I notice that the negative 1 and the positive 1 cancel out. The 2 out in front of the 2 epsilon and the 1 half in the leading order term cancel out. And what I'm left with is a dominant eigenvalue that to leading order 
is negative epsilon times pi squared divided by quantity n plus 1 squared. And what that tells me is that this system converges to a synchronized state in a manner that is linear in epsilon and inverse quadratic in n, the number of spinners. Is that something that you can see if you simulate this system, let it evolve? Yes, yes, it is something that you can see. And that's kind of cool that this all comes from eigenvalues, from dominant eigenvalues in particular. Now there's more that one could say with the components of the eigenvectors. That's kind of cool. I'm going to let you think about that.